Honorable Speaker, Mr. President, and my fellow South Africans, I am not here to criticize. So I would ask you, Mr. President, to perhaps just pay some attention because I'm here to try and give a constructive opinion as to what I think you and your cabinet should digest, perhaps for the betterment of all of us as fellow South Africans. So therefore, colleagues, one of the basic minimum program of priorities that was contained in the statement of intent for the government of national unity is rapid, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth which is underpinned by structural reforms, transformational change, and of course, sustainable, fiscal sustainability. So in short, the success or failure of the GNU will depend on the extent to which it pursues structural economic reforms to encourage, of course, investment, grow the economy, and create jobs for millions of unemployed South Africans. So nowhere will this test be more profound than at the perennially troubled state-owned enterprises. Failure, Mr. President, to pragmatically resolve the SOE question will have profound consequences, sir, not only for the term of this current administration, but for the country's long-term economic stability and, of course, future growth. It would be remiss on my part if I do not caution that there is an urgent course correction needed from the current policy trajectory to effectively resolve the systemic issues affecting SOEs and wean them off from dependency on taxpayer money. Placing SOEs under the overall oversight and responsibility of the presidency and creating a holding company to centralize their management will not, sir, improve their operational viability. And I will explain why. And neither, of course, will this promote market confidence with sector investment. One is looking for a glimmer of hope on whether pragmatism will inform SOE reforms going forward. That optimism was quickly extinguished, sir. According to media reports just last week, the minister in the presidency responsible for monitoring and evaluation Mr. Maropane Ramakhopa is said to be in opposition to in SOEs her. through equity stakes, preferring partnerships where the state retains full ownership. With most SOEs technically insolvent, sir, which private sector, I must ask, which private sector is going to forego equity ownership in an SOE but agree then to part with billions of run to fund SOE's operations with no clear path of how then will they recoup their investment. Of course, this is for those of you that can digest what I'm saying. In such an unrealistic expectation, you will either end up attracting opportunistic suitors, just as what happened with SAA and Takatsu. Remember the partnership that fell through? Or you will succeed, sir, in scaring away investors altogether. In the current economic climate, where the fiscus is stretched to the limit, we should be doing everything in our power to attract private investment and not to scare it away. SOEs, of course, have been wholly owned, state owned, uh, wholly state owned for the past 30 years. And during that time, they have become case studies of mismanagement, corruption, state capture, and of course, half-baked interventions with no operational improvements. And I'm sure you understand that pretty well, Mr. President. When then do we want to keep pursue, pursuing a state-led model funded through billions of run in taxpayer funds and expecting different results, I must ask? Better yet, Mr. Ramokhoba, who will you care to explain how 100% state ownership will help to deliver the financial stability and operational efficiency that these SOEs desperately need. I mean, that's a simple one for you to work out. Honorable members, the proposed creation of a national holding company to oversee 13 SOEs, including ESCOM, Transnet, and the South African National Roads Agency, raises several concerns. 
This new entity, as outlined in the National State Enterprises Bill, aims to centralize ownership and supposedly improve the viability of these enterprises. However, I must mention that this approach, sir, is fraught with potential pitfalls. First, the introduction of, national holding, of a national holding company will add an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy to an already complex and heavily regulated sector. Our SOEs operate under a myriad of legislature frameworks, including the Companies Act and specific statutes for entities such as Transnet, ESCOM, and SAA. Adding yet another bureaucratic structure could in lead to increased red tape, systemic inefficiencies, and of course, operational chaos. So, sir, the second financial in uh, implication of establishing this holding company are, si are significant. It, it will require its own executive leadership, it will require staff, budget, and, admin and administrative center. In a time when our nation's resources are stretched th so thin, we, can't, we can afford, can we afford, the question is, can we afford to divert funds to create a new entity instead of directly addressing the inefficiencies and the financial woes at the current SOEs? Mr. President, we need to seriously consider bringing in the private sector innovation and expertise in SOEs. We cannot ignore the grave reality that SOEs have been mismanaged for decades, relying heavily on government bailouts. The Finance Minister, Honorable Enoch Konogwane, has emphasized the urgent need for these entities to become self-sufficient. Is it realistic to believe that retaining 100% state ownership, even with operational partnerships, will achieve this goal? South Africa needs a bold vision for the SOE sector that puts the national interest first and looks beyond narrow vested interests. Transnet's weak performance has over the years severely impacted our mining, agriculture, and energy sectors. You've heard this before in other debates. It is my strong suggestion, sir, that when Transnet proposes the introduction of private sector participation at its rail and ports, their efforts should be given unconditional support. Therefore, sir, the idea of a national holding company are three. For SOEs that is deficient, the creation of a new SOE in the form of a holding company introduces yet another layer of bureaucracy to an already over-regulated sector. Establishing number two, the holding company will be expensive. These funds could be better spent directly addressing the issues of SOEs. Number three, the mismanagement structure between the management structure between the holding company and the individual SOEs has the potential to create operational chaos and inefficiency due to a duplication of efforts. So I wanted to, roll a, I wanted to end off, sir, by saying to you and conclude that I must caution that a holding company will potentially provide a fertile ground for state capture 2.0. And that should the country have the unfortunate prospect of being presided over by an individual with the same disposition as the discredited Jacob Zuma. So in conclusion, we must be vigilant and add complexity. Let us work together, sir, Honorable uh, members, to ensure that the industry is presently transferred. I realize I have touched the sensitive nerve, but you would understand. Honorable Isaac. Thank you. Honorable Isaac. Oh. No, it's fine. Thank you. Thanks. No, there was a point of order. You said thank you. Are you done? Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. I will now invite the Deputy Minister in the Presidency, Honorable Murolong. House Chairperson, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, Honorable Deputy President Paul Mashadile, Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, Bahai Sudumelang. In his acceptance speech as the first president of the Organization of African Unity, Emperor Haile Selassie, whose birthday was celebrated today, said, and I quote, history teaches us that unity is strength and cautions us to submerge and overcome our differences in the quest for common goals to strive with all our combined efforts 
and strength for the path to true African brotherhood and unity. Your Excellency, we, here in the most southern shores of our great continent, have been taught too well by our own history of division, racial prejudice, and subjugation that unity is strength and that we must submerge and overcome our differences in the quest for common goals. Madam Speaker or House Chair, the presidency is a strategic center of power and government with all its convening and coordinating power is charged with the responsibility to support the president as the head of national executive. We present this budget today to illustrate how the department seeks to translate the constitutional mandate of the president into a resource program of action. Three important pillars characterize the sixth administration. Firstly, building meaningful social compacts. Secondly, building a capable state. Thirdly, putting the state at the center of the country's development agenda. To this end, the presidency will both pivot these pillars in the seventh administration and complement them with a decisive program to build rapid, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth to create jobs. Therefore, as the presidency leads the coordination of the implementation of the economic reconstruction and recovery program, our driving agenda remains to build a South African economy that meets the needs of all its citizens. The ERRP must and will create jobs for youth, provide equitable distribution of income among South Africans, and create a better life for all. Honorable House Chairs, over the next five years, the presidential youth employment intervention will be institutionalized, and the SA Youth will be optimized and integrated with other government platforms. These will ensure that the youth have a single entry point to access services and earning opportunities. In our foreword to the 2023-2024 quarter report of the PYEI, we make bold the following assertions. A significant achievement of the PYEI is that the vast majority of earning opportunities have been accessed by the most excluded young people. In particular, 70% of opportunities have been accessed by young black African women. 73% have been accessed by young people who attended poorer resource quintile one to three schools, and 65% have been accessed by young people who live in households where at least one member receives a social grant. Honorable members, all of these are some of the victories scored from the coordinating effort of the presidency. These and many other efforts ensure that we strive with all our combined strength to build a globally competitive nation brand that attracts and retains both the foreign and domestic investment. House Chair, it is easier to become an armchair critic, to offer so-called expert advice, self-righteous diagnosis, and cold dissection of matters from the safety of our screen and verbose media statements. However, it is completely something else to consistently find solutions to complex problems, to marshal a nation out of a pandemic, to cushion the nation from economic crisis, to show strength and decisiveness in time of lagging threats and civil unrest, and to ultimately lead this nation into the next phase of the, of the democratic dispensation. Many can only wish that they could possess half the skill, the discipline, the prowess to lead as President Ramaphosa has led during his tenure. As I veer off the speech, there's one overzealous member of the opposition party who sometimes would refer to his political credentials having joined the struggle as a child. You know too well, Honorable Malema, that we too joined the struggle as children. The difference between you and us is that we do not use our political credentials to unblemish our already or your already blemished political career. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable